say hello to one of the most fuel inefficient cars of the 20th century. I'd rather not be another person you add on to your do not call list. But I'm gonna have to be if you're gonna tell me it's either choose you or sell off all this. In 1962, God's barber chair was never jacked higher. Gasoline cost less than bubblegum, and white bread was good for you. And the 1962 Buick LeSabre had a one-gear automatic transmission. Let that sink in for a second. One forward gear. Of course it has a reverse gear, and a neutral position, and a low position, but that's a lie! This has one gear. The transmission is the General Motors Dynaflow. It was designed in the late 40s and went out of production shortly after this Le Sabre, 1963 or thereabouts. Instead of multiple gears and clutch packs, the Dynaflow used a complicated, huge, high-stall torque converter to get the car going from a stop. The Dynaflow's one, quotes gear, if you even want to call it that, is a one-to-one -one ratio. The simplified way to think of a Dynaflow transmission is a big torque converter connected to a drive shaft. So what's up with the low setting on the column shifter? And why is the, why are the gear sets on the column shifter out of order? Why is reverse all the way at the end? Okay, this is long-winded, but it's interesting. The Dynaflow torque converter has variable stall speeds. What? Yeah. The blades of the converter's turbine move. It's like a variable pitch prop on an airplane. Yeah. All right, I think I'm good. Am I good? There's the kick down that's not a kick down. So it's now at a higher stall speed. It's just... The... You get no mechanical advantage. It just raises the stall speed to hopefully you're in a higher you know, power part of the power band. The Dynaflow in this 1962 Buick Le Sabre has the 1956 redesign of the Dynaflow because each version of the Dynaflow transmission was changed by General Motors to make the smoothest, quietest, least intrusive transmission possible. That was the luxury technology in the 1960s. The manufacturers got into this war to see who can make the smoothest shifting transmission in General Motors was like, I'm going to make it so smooth it's not going to even shift at all. Because it doesn't have any gears. It's going to be so soft, so smooth, slicker, and soft. Leather me up, goddammit. Burma shave me. I want my face to look like a fetus and my dick to look like a cadaver. The torque converter turbine has two blade positions. Cruise? and performance, I'm making air quotes. Under most driving conditions, even pulling out from a stop, the stator vanes remain in their cruise position. And this lead sled heaves itself away with the torque converter slipping, air quotes, all the way up to about 50 miles an hour, at which time both sides of the converter are moving in unison. Or, if needed, according to throttle position, valve pressure, or if you shift the column shifter into low or power or nonsense, that changes the angle of the stator vanes inside the converter and the stall speed raises to about that of a pro street drag car. Which sounds great, but this is still a one-to-one -one gear transmission. All that does is let the engine spin faster and waste Herculean amounts of fuel for a little faster acceleration speed. Listen to me. Even when driving normally, the 1962 Buick LeSaver averages six, six miles a gallon. Oh, 
even in the 60s, that was bad. And when you put it into performance mode or when you floor it, I don't even want to know. The Dynaflow is one of, or perhaps, the most inefficient transmission ever devised. 1962 Buick LeSabre. A car that asks how to use that smart TV you bought him for Christmas. I just want to put on Mannix. I didn't used to need two clickers to put on Mannix. I wish you and your sister would stop buying me stuff. I just want to watch Mannix. The LeSabre name was introduced as the 1951 LeSabre show car and featured a design inspired by aviation from the tail fins to the wraparound windshield, but LeSabre, as most people would come to know, didn't properly arrive until 1959 when it took over as the new name for the Buick Special. Not only was the LeSabre the entry-level Buick at the time, it was also a dependable bestseller among full-size offerings from General Motors. And although it would be downsized by 1977 and turned to a kind of boomer joke by the 90s, this LeSabre is from the glorious early 60s when Spider-Man made his debut. John Glenn orbited the Earth in the name of freedom and you could get a new wool suit for $45. This LeSabre serves up a 410 Wildcat V8, also known as the Nailhead because of the teeny tiny valves. Engine displacement is 6.6 .6 liters with a factory 280 horsepower rating and 410 foot-pounds of torque. However, this particular model has an aftermarket four-barrel carburetor that should theoretically get the output to around 325 horsepower and 425 pound-feet of torque. It's got a 10 to 1 compression ratio, so Adrian, the owner, has to run 93 on this thing. 93 with 6 miles a gallon. <laughs> you see, this engine was designed to make torque rather than horsepower, which is why the Wildcats are numbered after whatever their torque rating was. However, the engine has a higher bore than stroke with a forged crank and forged rod, so you probably expect it to be a high revving engine, but it mm -mm, doesn't make that, it doesn't do that because of the aforementioned tiny valves. The rest of the car has an X-frame or cross-frame chassis, and it's pretty ingenious. The drive shaft goes through the frame. It doesn't go under it, it goes through it. Because it runs through the center, you get a flatter floor and a forward engine. And the flat floor is really interesting. There's hardly any transmission tunnel here. You see, General Motors had the LeSabre's engine pushed farther forward in order to reduce transmission tunnel and provide stability, which is the base, which is the basis behind Buick's advanced thrust ads for the advanced thrust center. It even, it, it, they even used to say, it flattens the floor and beefs up the go. What? Every, every single car that tries to be sporty in some way or get some uh, weight engineering here has their engine farther back, as close to the middle of the car as it, as it can. Think, you know, uh, the, the, the seventh generation Corvette, even the sixth generation Corvette, and also the uh, Honda S2000. The, the front engine is as far back in the engine bay as they can put it. This is the exact opposite. Let's put the engine as far forward as we can. And, and they tried to say that, that was, it would make it accelerate better. Eh, it's a grandpa thriller, but it's also downright strange. I've been ignoring something in this engine bay. This clear bottle that fits in and snaps here is 100% alcohol, not denatured, the real stuff. This is 200 proof, and it sits in the engine bay. This is dangerous. You know, pure alcohol is almost an explosive. Its purpose is that you were supposed to measure out a little bit of this custom glass bottle that, that snaps in here for easy access and pour it into your wa uh, windshield washer reservoir, and that would keep it from freezing in the wintertime. But the idea was you were supposed to store that bottle in the engine bay, where it's nice and hot. And the only thing holding it closed is this little, is this little tin cap. <sighs> Adrian doesn't keep it there. This is a stupid idea. Well, I mean, let's have a whiff, I guess. Is it gonna smell like denatured or? Straight up alcohol. Ooh. Yeah, it smells like a doctor's office. Or a lab. I don't keep it under the hood because apparently this is a hard item to come by and I'd rather not have it fall out. Right.
And inside the car, the fuel gauge always reads full because the gauges don't generally work. There's one speaker in the dash, and the radio only plays static anyway, so no golden noties. Or Mets games here. What else? What else? What else? Let's, let's, let's get more specific about this awful fuel economy. Yes, six miles a gallon. Although Adrian got a full 10 miles a gallon on the drive up to film this, so cheers for progress. It has super soft coil springs that can practically sink the car under the weight of gas in a sheets diet. The car itself is 4,000 pounds of dad's aimless childhood stories with an aesthetic that makes far less sense now than in the land yachts of the 60s. It looks prepared to impose its will upon you. We're going to Crystal Cave. I decided this is a family trip this year, and you can cry all you want, but we're going. If I have to turn this car around, the belt's coming off. But we felt invincible driving this thing. Everybody, no matter what kind of bad day they were having, were looking at us and smiling. Four people wasting gas down the highway in this thing, and that was okay and even laudable in people's books. You can drive a 62 LeSabre and an officer will pull you over just to give you a high five and his daughter's phone number. It marks a point of transition from the youthful lack of inhibition to the domesticity of the nuclear family. You used to curse out your elders and carry around a switchblade, but now you got a baby that's too loud and a dog that's too quiet. A job in an unair conditioned warehouse pushing numbers and cranking the arm of an adding machine. And a wife you feel bad for unloading all your work damage onto. The local news was your nightly Super Bowl. The Super Bowl your Christmas. The daily newspaper gets the cover-to-cover -cover treatment. And the Buick LeSabre is the escape from the 9 to fivery of life. The reminder that all this toil will somehow work itself out. Even with the litany of things wrong with it, this LeSabre is mostly still original. Primer paint job notwithstanding. And Adrian would like to keep it that way as much as possible. I was trying to talk him into just clear coating right over the primer and just leaving it that way. Sure, it has an Edelbrock carburetor and a general maintenance that you'd expect in a car that's been around longer than Doctor Who, but it's still a classic. And Adrian has vowed not to LS swap this thing until the particular Wildcat engine explodes. Ignore as hard as you can the unfunny fuel economy of this Buick, and you're rewarded by a level of comfort and quiet on par with a Lexus LS400. The steering wheel is so effortless, Venom Snake could drive this car right out of the hospital. Look at that pinky finger. <laughs> Look at how relaxed I am driving the 62 LeSabre, lightly touching the steering wheel, one arm over the bench seat, and still plenty of room for Adrian over in the passenger area. I'm sitting sideways. I'll give a fall. Nothing is better than taking a shit after swimming in a heavily chlorinated pool. I'd rather not be another person you add on to your do not call list But I'm gonna have to be if you're gonna tell me it's either choose you or sell off all this Cause I don't do too well with ultimatums, babe, when they ship love to its axis There really needs to be a little something just for me cause the rest just goes to taxes And you, what's a classic car gotta do? Ooh.